Now you're, now you're experts at rope dragging for sparrows. <laughs> <laughs> Only one. I thought we'd see a whole mess of them. What is it? Grasshopper sparrow. Grasshopper sparrow. Oh, First bird in the morning. Yeah. Can't beat that. You're just an expert. We're in agreement that we're leaning towards it's the eastern migrant. It's very challenging to tell 100 percent for sure. Um, but what we'll do right now. Save them for later. <laughs> we don't want to. Later. Save them for later. Put them in a bag. Okay, so that's a bird bag. We'll do one more drive, and whether or not we get any more birds on that, we'll go. We'll process that bird. Okay. Good job. So the, the, the west line, walk back out on that, and then we'll do the same thing. Single so we're going to file back that way. Yep. That way That's the back. pattern. We'll do that three more times, and then four <laughs> times on that side. Um, these are actual bird bans issued by the government in the bird banning laboratory. And each species, despite uh, all species have various sizes. Obviously, small birds have small legs and big birds. So we have band sizes to accommodate all species, if you want to pass those around so people can see. Each band, regardless of the size, has a unique number, sort of like our social security numbers. So basically, we're giving this bird a social security number. This is a migrant grasshopper sparrow. It's likely this bird will fly north for its breeding season. Who knows? Georgia, maybe even New England. If there's another researcher up there doing a similar banding study and recaptures this bird, we'll have some information about um, how these birds move down the landscape. In fact, a lot of what we know about bird life around the planet is based on banding efforts. This is one of the most important tools ornithologists have to study birds. That's the number, Brian. Okay. You want to know? It's, uh, this bird is number 1851-84768. Wow. You got that, right? Yeah. So you're going to put that on the computer so any other birder who finds this bird will just know exactly where... All, all this data that we're collecting gets submitted to the bird banding laboratory in Patuxent, Maryland. And they're the clearinghouse in North America for all this, all this data. Canada has its own, you know, each, co each co um, country has its own similar... So these are specially created pliers, called banding pliers, and you'll see there's three different size holes in there. This nub right here, this is called a spreader, so that's what we use to open the band. The band's made out of aluminum, it's pretty soft. So you should be able to see that. Um, so the band is pretty small, almost weightless. They have done studies, um, it does not affect the bird's biology. It's, it's not really that much of a weight. It's like a bracelet. So I'm going to put that band, see it's already open, I'm going to put it in the appropriate hole. So that's the result, the bird's now banded. Skill. Seriously. Now, birds migrate great distances. What drives that migration are fat reserves. So when birds are pre-migratory, they'll start to build up fat reserves, and they build it up in their furcula area, which is what we call the wishbone, in their armpits, and above, uh, right below the rib cage. I'm going to look at those three areas right, right now and kind of gauge how much fat this bird has, if it has any. I'm preparing to make it. <laughs> <laughs> Not for a while. <laughs> it's still smelling. Yeah. Yeah. And it's got some fat. Um, I'd say a fat. The only way to sex them is during the breeding season, when the male and the female exhibit sexual characteristics. Males have what's called a cloacal protuberance. It's the mammalian equivalent to a penis. And females have a brood patch. Now she's, she will lose all the feathers on her breast, and the breast will become highly vascularized and red. And that's how she incubates her eggs. So that's the only way to tell them apart is during the breeding season. Look at the yellow on the wing. Back in John James Audubon days, this bird was actually known as the yellow-winged bunting. Uh -huh. <laughs> so this will pronounce when its wing is open? No, probably, probably less. <laughs> oh, no, a little bit more. Yeah, you're right. But I think most sparrow species have some degree of yellow on them somewhere, you know, more or less. This is kind of a, a, a moderate amount. It's yellow, yellow above the eye there, too. Yeah, for grasshopper sparrow, you definitely you're primarily looking at that white crown stripe, and then the ochre in the in the lore. So the lore is the area right above the eye, between the eye and the bill. So it's 
So if this thing's perched up somewhere and you get your binoculars on it and you don't hear it singing or something. Um, also, it's an Amage Ramus Sparrow. They're known for their little, tiny, short, stubby tails. Mm -hmm. And they don't have a forehead. Notice from the bill, it just goes right across the top and back of the head. And like an anvil. Okay? Let's, um, we'll step out in the prairie. We'll get everybody at Google's. And then we'll let this one go and we'll get back to it. All right. I have to go I'm going to try to get three. One, two, three. Bye.